Okay, well, um, I was gonna talk about colon cancer and stem cell competition and so on, but I, this has been such a terrific uh, you know, day today. First of all, Kat, phenomenal. And your, your team, uh, this has been a phenomenal meeting. I, I mm. thought it would be interesting to talk about some of our work in telomeres and specifically telomerase and non-canonical functions of, of TERT, telomerase reverse transcriptase. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on, on, on telomerase uh, and then get into some, some new data that we've generated, which I think has implications for, for aging uh, and for age-associated diseases. Uh, those are my disclosures which bear no relevance to um, what I'll be talking about. We all know this, you know, dramatic increase in age-associated um, diseases uh, culminating in the dire statistics you see at the bottom. Uh, and we were very interested about 30 years ago in trying to understand, well, what is it about advancing age that actually drives the development of cancer, and not just all cancers, but epithelial cancers in particular. And so we, we surmise that maybe uh, telomere dysfunction may, may be one explanation for this, in part because as mice age, they don't develop epithelial cancers, they develop mesenchymal and hematopoietic malignancies. Uh, and there are very significant differences in telomere dynamics. You know, mice have more promiscuous expression of telomerase, long telomeres, whereas humans, it's limiting, and so on. And telomeres are cap the ends of chromosomes, uh, and they help solve the end replication problem, and they also protect uh, the ends of chromosomes through, through, through the shelter and complex. Highly regulated structure uh, that really helps keep our genomes intact. Now, um, there are two main components to telomerase. There's the RNA template, which serves uh, uh, to, as the template for the de novo addition of telomere uh, repeats, and then the catalytic subunit telomerase reverse transcriptase. Uh, and so we wanted to understand, you know, what would happen if we were to engineer mice with shorter, more human-like telomeres? What is actually the function of telomerase and telomeres uh, at the organismal level. To that point, uh, it was just cell culture-based studies, you know, hay flick limit, passage, so on. You walk the telomere plank, you, you know, induce senescence, ultimately you go through crisis. And so uh, we collaborated uh, with Carol Greider's lab, um, so Maria Blasco and, and Hanu Lee in our respective labs generated this first knockout. This is the RNA template component. Uh, and in G1, the animal still had very long telomeres, even though with telomerase deficient, there was no phenotype. So then we crossed it to G2, and then G3, folks in the field were saying, give up, mice are different. Uh, anyway, by the time we got to G3, we began to see some really interesting things, which was a fulfillment of this McClintock hypothesis where uh, 60 years earlier, she, she, she surmised that you know, the uh, ends of chromosomes, the telomeres, are important for maintaining chromosomal integrity, and if you lose them, uh, you get end-to-end -end fusions. And that's exactly what, what we saw, which was where you, uh, are lo you lose the telomere signal, and we did that with Peter Lansdorp at the time, and uh, we saw that there were these Robertsonian end-to-end -end fusions. Now, coincident with this, uh, we began to see cytogenetic evidence, uh, um, uh, with the cytogenetic evidence, we began to see phenotypes emerge. So the animals experienced premature aging across the organism. Uh, they had a diminished capacity to handle acute and chronic stress, uh, similar to aged uh, humans. Uh, and organ systems, particularly those with high proliferative activity, like GI tract, skin, hematopoietic system, uh, were severely affected, and so there was a lot of organ atrophy and so on. Uh, and we saw that there was uh, uh, depletion of the stem cells through a P53-dependent uh, apoptotic response. And indeed, you know, at that time, it wasn't really clear what an eroded telomere did and how it signaled, and we suspected it might be equivalent to a DNA damage signal. Mike Kasten had taught us in the 1990s that P53 is important for sensing uh, DNA damage and executing uh, cellular checkpoint responses like senescence, apoptosis, et cetera. Uh, and so we essentially, and the we in this case was Linda Chin, 
where we brought the P53 mutant allele through these successive generations. And uh, by the time we got to G5 and G6, I'm showing you just this uh, cross section through the seminiferous tubules. On, on the left, you see a sixth generation animal where you have depletion of the germ cells again to apoptotic elimination. Uh, and on the right is a litter mate control at the same level of telomere dysfunction, but you've restored the cellularity of the testes. And so this taught us that P53 senses eroded telomeres uh, and executes the cellular checkpoint response. And throughout the organism, uh, the, uh, the uh, sequelae of eroded telomeres was dramatically attenuated. Now, what was really interesting to us as cancer biologists is that with this cells that are now surviving, at a time when you have all this genomic instability, uh, we actually saw an increase in cancer. And this was the exact opposite of what the field expected, because we all naively thought that you needed telomerase to become cancer. And so this taught us that when you have this uh, situation where you have genomic instability and you've deactivated DNA damage signaling, that those can actually provide a mutator mechanism for the genesis of cancer. Now, those cancers have a feeble progression phenotype. You need telomerase to really stabilize the genome and have full malignant progression. But the most interesting thing that Steve Artandi uh, showed when he was in the lab was that um, the, it wasn't just an increase in cancer, but we humanized the tumor spectrum of these mice. So they developed colon cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer, and those cancers, instead of having a benign cytogenetic profile like you see typically in a mouse cancer, uh, they had radically altered cytogenetic profiles. Uh, with, because you have a double-strand break-inducing condition, uh, you create amplification, deletion at the site of break, you have translocations, and you're doing this throughout the genome randomly, and if you hit a uh, oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene, you'll amplify, delete, so on and so forth. So this basically provides a mutator mechanism that's missing in mice, and as soon as you engineer mice to experience uh, telomere-based crisis, uh, they can now generate epithelial cancers uh, and amplifications and deletions of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about aging. And a, you know, telomeres are considered to be a hallmark uh, of aging, but what we've learned over the last, you know, 10 plus years uh, is that uh, telomere dysfunction or telomerase biology uh, is not only a hallmark, but it links to virtually all other hallmarks. I mean, a very simple example is senescence, where you activate P53 and you can incur senescence in a cell that's experiencing telomere dysfunction. Um, we, we know that uh, when you start to fragment your DNA, you can activate C-gas sting, and that causes uh, inflammaging. Uh, we showed recently that it can activate YAP, which actually regulates pro-IL-18, which is a major recruiter of, of T cells and can really cause a lot of tissue inflammation, uh, so on and so forth. That's both in mice and in humans. Um, and I'll just give you one example of how intimate this link is between telomere dynamics and a really important hallmark which relates to mitochondrial biology. And that is a pathway that we discovered about uh, 15 years ago where we did unbiased analyses in a mouse that was experienced telomere dysfunction. So hematopoietic cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells, liver, heart, brain, et cetera. And we looked at the transcriptomes and the dominant transcriptome in all of them were genes that were uh, important for mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial function and oxidative defense. And we went on to show that a lot of those targets that were dysregulated were PGC1 alpha and 1 beta targets, which Bruce Spiegelman you know, has shown is the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial function. They also regulate uh, uh, oxidative defense. They turn on you know, a lot of genes that are important for ROS uh, quenching. And so when you have uh, accumulating DNA damage, uh, you s tonically signal to P53, P53 sits on the PGC1 alpha and 1 beta promoter and it represses them. 
and then you have a decrease in all of the you know, complex genes, et cetera, uh, and you uh, uh, really impact mitochondrial uh, function, but you also dramatically reduce uh, oxidative defense. And so this then leads to an enormous increase in ROS, and ROS actually really injures telomeres because you know, ROS attacks G-rich sequences, telomeres are G-rich, also, telomeres cannot repair themselves because their sheltering complex repels DNA repair machinery. So this is one of the reasons why telomeres are important uh, in aging, in part because they accumulate damage and ultimately a threshold that leads to this signaling. And then you can imagine from this, you then get a reinforcing feed-forward loop that really escalates and accounts for this you know, acceleration of aging late in life and so on. And so with this, you know, we asked, well, if this is the case, you know, what would happen if we were to toggle telomerase on and off? Would it do anything? Would it slow aging? Would it repair mitochondria, so on and so forth? And so uh, what Mariella just Kelly off did is she engineered a knock-in in which she knocked in the estrogen receptor moiety into the um, beginning of the open reading frame of TERT to create a fusion, a TERT ER fusion protein. And uh, this is a denatured protein in the absence of tamoxifen. And as soon as you add tamoxifen, you get released from HSP90, you renature the protein, and the protein uh, can then generate telomeres. So when you're in the absence of tamoxifen, these homozygous mice are like the knockout. Uh, you gen bring them through successive generations and they phenocopy what I described earlier. So now we're in a position to flip telomerase back on. In this case, the instigator of premature aging. These animals had diminished fecundity, they had alopecia, hair graying, uh, thin bones, pathologic fractures, uh, you know, diminished capacity to um, respond to hematopoietic stress, uh, liver repair. Uh, you name it. They were uh, very, very uh, sick animals. And then uh, we asked, you know, in a state of pretty advanced aging, uh, what would happen if we were to turn the, remove the instigator of the aging process? And we were expecting it to slow down uh, and, you know, or, 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 may, or not work at all. And we saw this throughout the organism, a dramatic reversal in the aging phenotype. So um, alopecia was restored, the gut came back, uh, the hematopoietic system came back, uh, germ cells were restored, fecundity was restored, so on and so forth. I'm just showing you one example here, which is in the middle panel, you can see that the SOX2 positive progenitor cells are essentially almost eliminated, and then with just short course of treatment, these SOX2 positive cells come back, you start to generate you know, uh, new neurons and so on, uh, in that fourth bar that you see there. So, so stem cell uh, reserves were, were restored and, uh, and then uh, their uh, neurogenesis was also restored and we actually showed that these neurons were functional uh, in various memory tests and so on. So one of the most interesting and annoying results that we had was that we saw the restoration in post-mitotic tissues. So like the heart, the cardiac output improved. Uh, we saw, in this case, these are oligodendrocytes, and we saw restoration of myelination. The G ratios were restored. Uh, and that was curious because telomerase makes telomeres and, 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 and fixes telomeres in S phase, right? You have to go through S phase in order to make a telomere. These are post-mitotic cells, so how the heck is that going on? So we really didn't know, and we were trying to you know, figure this out and so on, but there was a one, one study that kind of got us to realize that TERT does much more than just synthesize telomeres, and that was this result here. So this is a G, G1 TERT heterozygous mouse. So it's just missing 50% of TERT protein. And what you see here is, and you know, we did transcriptomic analysis at the time, is that BDNF was significantly decreased and APP was dramatically increased along with many other aging genes. But these in particular I show because they're very relevant to neurodegeneration, very relevant to AD in particular. And we had many AD genes that were affected. 
So then we asked, well, you know, is this relevant? And we looked in normal aging tissues, very advanced age, both in mouse and human, and TURD is epigenetically repressed. Interestingly, when we looked in Alzheimer's models and in IPS and so on, we saw that TURT levels were decreased before onset of any phenotypes very early on. So this got us thinking that maybe TURT is regulated, modulated uh, in a way that you know, might be relevant, pathogenetically relevant to some of these diseases. So we used two different models, the uh, th uh, 3XTG model and the 5XFAD models that are the workhorses for AD models. Um, and what you can see here is that pretty early on uh, in these, and I, I, both in the brain and I just have here the primary neurons, you could see that the non-transgenic versus uh, the models show a decrease in the uh, mRNA levels of TERT. And if in the lower right-hand corner, you see uh, that when you look at the controls versus FAD, and these are, again, are prior to any phenotypic onset, uh, we see significant repressive marks correlating with decreased expression uh, in the TERT locus, and including, including the promoter. So, and we can, we can actually alleviate this with um, inhibitors of histone uh, methylase. So this is an H3K9 uh, trimethylation mark, which is a repressive mark. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, being a geneticist, we wanted to actually do a genetic experiment in which we asked, well, what if we could maintain TERT levels in the AD models or in uh, IPS models in humans? And so the way that we did this is we generated an allele with a stopper cassette that would be active in all cells of the body. Uh, and it allowed us to, with the stopper, uh, to use specific Cree lines to be able to control the spatial expression of this. So we wanted to only restore TERT and neurons and assess the impact and so on. And so, uh, and then to do that, we used the CAM kinase 2 Cree uh, ERT2. So we generated these mice, we crossed them to the, to, to the two different strains. Uh, and then we uh, gave them tamoxifen, and then TERT became active, and we nicely restored the physiological range expression of TERT in these animals, both at the RNA and at the protein level. And so that was uh, this, this uh, model system. And I'm just going to summarize, because this is published, but what we saw was a dramatic decrease uh, in uh, A-beta deposits intracellular, uh, we saw, you know, higher complexity of neural networks. Those are the two on the right. Um, and we, by transmission electron microscopy, we see that dendritic spine density was quite uh, impressively restored. And so that was just from maintaining TERT levels and so on. So the question is, how does this happen? So uh, we wanted to, you know, we, we did a number of experiments, and so this is not necessarily in order, but we did transcriptomic analysis in the mouse uh, where we looked for things that were upregulated, you know, control versus upregulated, both in uh, cortical neurons, hippocampal neurons, and so on. And the number one, uh, which was consistent with the phenotype, was uh, synaptic signaling as the main go uh, category that we saw. And, uh, and I'm just showing you some other genes as well, which was APP, when you turn to Lyme or APP, uh, amyloid precursor protein is down, expression, APOE goes down, and a very important uh, gene that's important for maintenance of neuronal survival, which is HSP70 alleles, were, were both increased, transcriptionally upregulated. So that was the mouse, and now we wanted to ask, what happens you know, in the context of a more human uh, system? And here we use Goldstein's um, a, uh, du duplicated APP gene, which is uh, you know, a, 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 a family that has this, uh, and he generated uh, IPS um, uh, for, for, this, uh, for this allele. Uh, and then that afforded us with the opportunity to then transduce TERT and see if we can modify uh, the transcriptome and, and a variety of other phenotypes. And here again, you know, as you differentiate these uh, cells into neurons, uh, the, uh, this is just, again, the, um, a, uh, the, the TERT locus uh, in the IPS versus the non-demented IPS controls, uh, there is significant epigenetic repression of TERT 
Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, when you use uh, inhibitors, uh, histone demethylase inhibitors, you can uh, clean up the repressive mark and you could increase the transcriptional uh, expression of, uh, of, of, of telomerase, t uh, telomerase reverse transcriptase. Okay, so then uh, we looked at the kinetics of expression of things like uh, APP uh, and A beta um, uh, accumulation. We also looked at gene expression, and again, I'm just showing you at the top, what you see uh, is that in the case of uh, TERT, you can, if you express TERT, you don't accumulate A beta 140. Uh, and in the case of, of TERT, the red bars, you see an increase in genes like uh, sirtuins. Uh, and this is with this known that telomerase regulates sirtuin gene expression, uh, versus all, all the sirtuins, not just uh, sirt one um, PSD90, so very important for synapse biology, the HSPs, as I mentioned, and, and genes involved in oxidative defense like, you know, NRF2 and so on. So lots of genes that are involved in aging uh, as well as in um, pathobiology of neurodegeneration. So now, is this at all related to telomerase activity? So we generated uh, a D712A mutation, which takes out the catalytic activity, uh, and you could see that it still works, um, that if you introduce this now, this is in the, um, I think it's in the human iPS cells, you have maintenance of, um, of SIRT expression, BDNF, so on and so forth. So it doesn't require um, its catalytic activity. So now we had the opportunity to really integrate human data, mouse uh, transcriptome data of various types, with or without TERT, so on and so forth, uh, and look at the categories of genes that are impacted by uh, maintenance of, of telomerase or restoration of, of TERT uh, expression. And number one, we're learning in memory genes, genes involved in synapse biology and so on. Um, and, and this uh, nicely correlated with the fact that these animals in various learning and memory tests, I'm just showing you the escape hole uh, test where animals learn where the escape hole is. So when you go lower, you're doing better. And you could see that when you uh, activate um, telom tert, uh, you do better in finding the uh, escape hole versus uh, the controls uh, in these AD models, both in, in the uh, 3XTG uh, as well as the 5XFAD. Uh, okay, so that is um, some of the genetic data. So obviously, um, this is great, um, but we can't make transgenic folks. Uh, we could certainly do stem cell transplantation, as we heard today. Uh, so we, we wanted to uh, develop modulators of, of tel telomerase reverse transcriptase. I mentioned earlier this is reversible. We can use histone demethylase inhibitors and so on to do this. So we wanted to really, first of all, understand what was, what was going on and why is it that TERT does what it does. And it turns out that TERT is a transcriptional coactivator. Uh, it actually physically interacts with the mediator complex. And we're still trying to figure out the structure and the biochemistry of this in detail. But, you know, when you do mass spec, you pull down RNA polymerase, you pull down mediators, uh, and very importantly, we pull down beta-catenin, active beta-catenin. Um, and so this is well known that beta-catenin is among the most important genes for learning and memory and, and neuronal homeostasis. So this was very exciting to us because it suggested that TERT was in the beta-catenin complex and helping to modulate beta-catenin targets. And so we looked at this and we basically chipped where we could see TCF7, active beta-catenin, we can also chip a TERT. And these are just beta, known beta-catenin targets and you can see that the peaks are all the same in these different uh, 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 targets of uh, beta-catenin. Okay, um, and then I didn't show you the data, but we actually show that these oligomers uh, that are pathognomonic for, for AD and, and, and normal aging as well as, as time passes, I'm sure I have quite a bit in my own head, uh, is that if you dump these on cell, in cell culture-based systems, you can actually accumulate the epigenetic mark. So we think that in some way, and we're still trying to figure out, again, the biochemistry of this, is that this is actually modulating 
uh, chromatin biology in the TERT locus uh, to instigate this repression of TERT that then leads to its reduction and, and, and failure to work uh, as a transcriptional coactivator. So, so that was the, the genetics, and I want to give you uh, an update on some pretty interesting data that we generated in collaboration with uh, Pete Schultz here at the Scripps. Uh, we came to the Mecca, uh, and, um, and, and Mike Bolong, uh, and we, we wanted to look for activators of telomerase. And I, there has been a lot of work in this area but we wanted something that can penetrate the blood-brain barrier, uh, modulate uh, TERT in very specific ways, in ways that we know how it works, and so on. Um, and the way that we went about doing this, which I think was uh, key, was the, we generated a back transgenic that with the human TERT locus, and then we showed that, and so the regulation of the mouse allele and the human allele is different. Um, and so the cis elements are largely conserved, but there are very important differences, as Frank Frenari would tell us. And so, so we wanted to see if this human TERT would be regulated like human across different tissues from a developmental stage standpoint and tissue-specific standpoint, and fortunately it was. So we knew that all the cis elements were there, and then we used these cells derived from these animals to screen uh, a large library of novel compounds that were druggable compounds, um, and, uh, and then we wanted to see if we could you know, activate um, TERT and so on, and we successfully did that. We know the cis element, the pathway through which this works, it's, it's one, it's AP, essentially, and essentially, I'm gonna show you that what TAC does, and this is, we did these by IP injection, but this or orally bioavailable. So in cell culture, we show that in human fibroblasts, we, with a single shot, we can uh, increase the expression of TERT and alleviate the repressive mark. Uh, and this is Wern's fibroblast showing that you actually have more TERT. You can actually now synthesize telomeres, so you have more dots on the right than on the left. Um, and then also, we, in, the, in the body, we could see, like in the hippocampus, the cortex, skeletal muscle, heart, that um, a single shot of this uh, is able to increase the expression in vivo uh, as soon as eight hours after you know, the injection. And so that was, uh, that was good. So all cells appear to be modulated by this compound. So then we did a very simple experiment. So these were animals, again, uh, and this is the 3TG at six months. So those of you who know the model, uh, you know, the, no, no phenotype at that point. Um, and uh, we then did uh, IP injections uh, for either three or six months and then analyzed various things. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of data here, which is that we uh, alleviate microglial activation. Um, and so this is, I'm just showing you one, one important marker. Which, and, and the inflammation that occurs in the brain in AD is a ma causes a real conflagration um, and, and really contributes to the pathology. Uh, we see, as I showed you with the genetic experiment, that we see a reduction uh, in intracellular amyloid levels and a very significant difference in the extracellular accumulation of amyloid plaque. We haven't done cognitive studies yet. Hopefully, they'll be done very soon. So just to summarize, TERT is epigenetically repressed. Uh, in normal aging, and we have some really provocative data in normal aging, it essentially reverses virtually all hallmarks of aging. Senescent cells are eliminated, uh, inflammation, uh, inflammation is, is reduced, so on and so forth. Um, we saw interesting things in the brain as well, which we can talk about. Um, and that just the maintenance of TERT uh, is able to alleviate a lot of these phenotypes. Um, and um, and that you know the pharmacology and the genetics match up nicely, and it's very well tolerated. Uh, so two main functions for telomerase, maintain telomeres, very important, uh, and particularly for uh, proliferative tissues. And then also uh, it has this you know, co-activator function and so on. So um, these are the folks that did the work, and Hong is the, you know, almost single-handedly did all of this work that I showed at the end. Uh, and folks that are in the lab that help out. And then Pete and Mike uh, were hugely helpful 
uh, and the IPS cells, you know, we got from uh, Lee Wei, who's a rock star. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. DePino. What a wonderful work. So let's take some questions. Frank, Frankie. Hey, Yaron, that was awesome. I'm curious about the non-canonical function of TERT when it's bound to those promoters. Is there a RNA component within that complex that's tethering uh, TERT to those proteins? Uh, we haven't done, we, have, we haven't, you know, done structure function analysis yeah. to see. Uh, you know whether or not it's it's in there. It's a it's a reasonable question. Um, yeah. We kind of didn't pursue that once we knew the catalytic thing wasn't important. But of course, the RNA could tether all sorts of other proteins. You know, in that in that complex, it's a it's a good question. And when is your compound going to be? Oh, available? actually, <laughs> um, we the mass spec we didn't see uh, RNA associated proteins. So prob probably not but we don't know for sure. When is the compound ready? Uh, we probably do IND enabling studies in the not too distant future. We're trying to see if we can optimize things a little bit. But. Hi, Ron up here. Great talk. I wonder if it's targeting senescent cells in the brain or non-dividing cells in the brain is good, but when you get that compound peripherally, does it target other dividing cells throughout, throughout the body or the mouse, and how does it affect those? It does. Um, so it um, it does a lot of things. Um, so f I guess the most striking thing is, and we know how this works because uh, the the genes, you know, the methyl transferase, DNA methyl transferase, is that it works. But you know, as you know, when you age, you have methylation changing, gene body methylation, promoter methylation changing as a course of of advancing age, uh, and this actually wipes out. The, and makes it more, you know, a youthful pattern uh, methylation. So uh, you see uh, P16 gets um, eliminated, uh, cell, senescent cells um, reverse, uh, and we see an impact on um, inflammatory. So, you know, you're affecting senescence and SASP. So we see, you know, IL-6 IL, IL going down and IL-beta, IL-1 beta, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we see improvements in renal function, improvements in cardiac output, so on and so forth. Uh, this, is in, this is in the normal aged mouse. So these are mice that are 20 months old, and so they have about seven more months to live. And then we've, you know, we do um, six, six months of treatment and analyze them at six months. So all the things I just mentioned, they have new neurons uh, and they preserve cognitive function. Nervousness is gonna stimulate if there's a dormant tumor somewhere that they might activate it? No, so actually, you know, you'd expect it to be less cancer. Uh, you know, so you're maintaining physiological levels of TERT. Uh, it's kind of like what you have in your germ cells. Uh, so, in fact, you know, the work that I showed at the beginning, it's the lack of telomeres, insufficient telomeres, that actually causes the problem with epithelial carcinogenesis in particular. Now, if you were to have super physiological expressions of TERT, that would be a problem, you know, 20X, 30X. And in fact, one of the things that we did early on, which was very perplexing at the time, is that Steve Artani actually overexpressed TERT throughout the body uh, very industrial levels, uh, and the animals developed breast cancer. Why? Because stem cell pools were increasing. And that, you know, is consistent with the beta catenin phenotype and so on, but it was very high levels of TERT. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about really transient and uh, kind of twofold, you know, restoration back to the, the waterline. Beautiful work, and I think we'll move on here. 